Have you ever listened in on a phone conversation between two toddlers? I recently watched a video of my son and his cousin chatting over the phone when they were about two years old. The conversation was definitely lively, but also very confusing. My son was giving a colorful description of the apple trees and apples all around him that you could see in the video as he attempted to share with his cousin all about the world around him. But on the other end, his cousin couldn't see that world. And even though his parents tried to lead him into the conversation about apples, he was more concerned with the old deflating balloon in their living room where he was located at that time. The two toddlers could not get on the same page, no matter how hard the rest of us tried to lead them. This is a classic example of stage two, the pre-operational period of Piaget's theory, or what he liked to call genetic epistemology, or as Marcy Driscoll describes it in Psychology for Learning Instruction, a theory of knowledge describing how a child learns and begins to understand the world around them. Hi, my name is Mindy Grossenbacher. I'm a student at ESU along with Chris Watterson, and we're here to tell you about this proposed stage of cognitive development by Jean Piaget. While there are many theories about cognition development, Piaget has played an important role in helping us understand how a child's knowledge develops as he or she grows. Jean Piaget was a Swiss biologist, philosopher, and child psychologist in the 1900s. He studied childhood learning and cognition. And while observing his own children, he noticed that children seemed to think in a different way than adults. But he wasn't just interested in their IQ. He wanted to understand how a child acquires knowledge and concepts such as number, time, quantity, even justice. Through his research, he developed a way of distinguishing the types of knowledge that children acquire. These types are physical knowledge, that is basically knowledge about the world around you, the physical aspects that we can see, feel, hear, etc. Logical mathematical knowledge, which is basically abstract knowledge that we gain through our own actions and observations, and social knowledge, that is knowledge that can only be acquired through interaction with other people within our own culture. Recognizing these types of knowledge and how it is gained led him to propose four stages of development in a child's cognitive growth. These four stages are sensory motor period, during which a child forms basic schemes and becomes goal-oriented, pre-operational period, which we will be focusing on, where the child begins to understand object permanence, develop early problem solving, and display egocentric behavior, concrete operational period, during which understanding of conversation and concrete logical reasoning grows, as well as the ability to reverse thinking, and formal operational period. In this final stage, the child graduates to abstract logical reasoning. They are able to hypothesize and they develop concern for social issues. Our focus is on stage two, the pre-operational period, when a child begins to really interact with the world around them. From age two to seven, children develop several characteristics that Piaget claims showcase their development from stage one and leads to further development in stage three. These characteristics include parallel play, one of the first characteristics noted in this stage. Children begin to move and discover the world around them and while they begin interacting with their surroundings and other people or children, we often might find them playing in a classroom full of children yet still playing alone, not always engaging with their peers and their actions. Symbolic representation. This is another characteristic displayed toward the beginning of this stage. It describes how a child learns to use something to represent another thing. This is key in language development as a child begins to learn labeling and the naming of objects. As they develop, they will move on to pretend or symbolic play where the child begins to take on pretend roles. This can be seen when a child puts on a cape and becomes Superman or mimics a favorite TV character or a firefighter. While egocentrism is a major characteristic of this stage, as we'll see later, developing symbolic play does demonstrate the decline of egocentrism as children begin to play with one another and cooperate as they engage in the same games. 
Animism is another characteristic unique to this stage. Animism is the belief that inanimate objects have thoughts and feelings just as humans do. For example, a child might believe that their doll feels pain if dropped on the floor. Artificialism is displayed during this stage. That is the idea that people create certain parts of the world around them, such as the trees or the weather. A child might believe that her parents can somehow stop the thunder during a storm and not understand when her parents do not comply with her request to do so. Children in stage two are unable to reverse a sequence, a characteristic known as irreversibility. This is one of the key characteristics that distinguish children in this stage from stage three, where they begin to develop the ability to recount events in a different order from which they occurred. Children in stage two will find it difficult to recount a specific event in reverse order from end to starting point. Centration describes the difficulty children in this stage face when viewing their world. With centration, children are unable to consider more than one aspect of a problem. For example, if a child receives a cup of juice in a large cup while their peer receives, a juice, receives juice in a small cup, the child will not understand that the amount of juice may be the same. In the child's eyes, the juice in the large cup looks less looks like less than that of the juice in the smaller cup, leading the child to believe that they have received less. And egocentrism, as mentioned, is strongly displayed during stage two. And just like centration and irreversibility, it produces a limiting effect on how children view the world around them. Egocentrism is the inability to consider the views of others. This characteristic causes children to project their own feelings and perceptions onto others around them. Researchers have developed some very interesting tasks and tests while studying stage two and how it is displayed in a child's behavior. One of these tasks is very good at helping us see how egocentrism plays out in a child's description of what they see. Now, once again, egocentrism is displayed in a child's point of view where a child is unable to see a situation from another point of view. It's displayed in observations. The child's, child thinks others see, feel, and hear the same as they do. We can see it in conversation, where children at this stage tend to talk over one another without really listening to what the other person has to say. And in their intuitive thinking, where a child's thinking is guided by their own judgments and observations without considering what others think about a situation. Piaget developed the three mountain task to decipher whether a child displays egocentric tendencies or not. While completing this task, a child is asked to share what they see on their side of the mountain and observe what the other person might see on their side of the mountain. If a child doesn't recognize that the other person's view is different than their own, the child is displaying egocentrism. In this mountains game, you really get a sense that children aren't just little adults. They often see the world in surprising ways. Here, the adult and child sit at opposite sides of the table. They can see one side of the mountain scene in front of them. Once they've had a chance to look at the mountain, the adult asks the child to point to which of the four mountain scenes that the adult can see. This requires children to think about the mountain scene from another person's perspective. Often, younger children like five-year-old Brayden, they point to the mountain scene that corresponds with their own perspectives of the mountains and not the adults. However, a few years can make all the difference. Delaney, who is eight years old, can take someone else's perspective more easily. And instead of pointing to the scene from her own perspective, she points to the mountain scene that the adult can see. This game really shows how often children think about and see the world differently than adults. But this is a normal process where children develop what's called a theory of mind, or the ability to see something from someone else's perspective. Sometimes it seems like young children just don't care about other people's thoughts or feelings, but really it's a natural process of learning how to take another perspective and think about something in a very different way than they're used to.
While egocentrism is considered one of the most defining characteristics of stage two for children ages two through seven, what many find is that this trait is not limited to these ages and that children younger than age seven can display a recognition of others' views. It also limits the idea that egocentrism can continue on in a child's life even into adulthood. As some researchers have pointed out, even adults can display characteristics of egocentrism. Some are more adept at overcoming this characteristic than others. Thank you for that fantastic overview, Mindy. Hi everyone, this is Chris Watterson and I'll be continuing our discussion of PAJ's Stage 2 of Development. In doing this research, I began to realize that I actually have examples of Stage 2 from my own life. I have three daughters who are now ages 13, 10, and 5, and I remember I had photos of my now 10-year-old perfectly exemplifying this stage. In this first series of photos, she's probably around two years old and is deeply engaged in symbolic play because she thinks the Barbie furniture is her furniture. She was always very small for her age, about two years behind the growth curve, so she really loved tiny, tiny toys and imagined that she was part of them for the longest time. And as you can see here, she's drinking from a Barbie teacup. In this photo, she really believed she was hiding because she could not see us. This is a great example of stage two egocentric thinking. Of course, you don't want to watch this presentation to see my boring family photos, although I think she's super cute. So here's a video I found online that describes some more characteristics of stage two. According to Jean Piaget, children enter the pre-operational stage of cognitive development during the preschool years. Their thinking changes dramatically in that they now have the capacity to think symbolically, using words or objects to represent something else. Sarah and Jill dress up and have a tea party. Later, they feed their doll. Four-year-old Jared pretends he is a spy kid and chooses an appropriate costume. Todd and Jared show further increases in mental representation. They are engaged in what Piaget called symbolic play, clearly imagining that the blocks they are playing with are something else. In this case, a building. Despite these increases in cognitive skills, the thought processes of pre-operational children result in characteristic errors in reasoning. One of the most easily observed efficiencies is the tendency to view the world only from one's own perspective, a phenomenon that Piaget termed egocentrism. Because of egocentric thinking, Pre-operational children hide by covering their eyes or only parts of their bodies, believing that if they can't see the seeker, then they themselves can't be seen. Other pre-operational reasoning errors result from thinking that is intuitive rather than logical. For example, preschool children are incapable of conservation. They do not understand that certain properties of objects, such as volume or mass, do not change just because the superficial appearance of the object changes. When given two of Piaget's famous conservation tasks, Olivia, Deborah, Jacob, Christopher, and Jack, illustrate this lack of understanding. Is there the same amount in each one of those glasses? Okay, now I'm going to take this one. Right in here. Is there the same amount in each glass now? No. Which one has more? So this one has more than this one. I'd say if that one is bigger than and that one's smaller, that one has the most. 
Does that look like the same amount of Play-Doh? Each one's the same one? Okay. I'm going to go like this. Let's wash it down like that. Now, does that look like it's the same amount still? Which one's more? That one. Mm, that one. Yep, this one. This one. Pre-operational children are not only tied to their perceptions, they are also unable to decenter their thinking or think about more than one aspect of a problem at a time. Their thinking also shows what Piaget called irreversibility. They are unable to reverse or mentally undo an action. The following responses to the question, why do they no longer have the same amount, illustrate these limitations in pre-operational thinking. Deborah, age three. Because tall. Christopher, age four and a half. Is this one's higher than this one. Jack, age five. Because this one's low and this one's tall. Olivia, age three. That one is up, that one is down. Deborah, age three. Because it's squish. Jacob, age four. Because you smushed that one down and that one and not that one. That one has the most. As children move into the concrete operational stage of middle childhood, they are no longer fooled by appearances. While each of the four stages of Piaget's theory describe unique characteristics of a child's cognitive development, here are some tips that could help you as a parent or a teacher who may be working with children specifically in stage two. Recognizing the characteristic of this stage, a teacher can help the child develop towards what is not yet understood. For example, because language and symbols are somewhat of a new concept to the children, it's best for teachers or parents to keep instructions straightforward with lots of visuals. Children should also have the opportunity to develop language skills, and this can be accomplished in a social setting, or it can also include older children to allow for scaffolding to take place. And finally, building upon the skills gained in the sensory motor stage by involving as many senses as possible. Across the sources I read, one fact that kept popping up is that children in this stage have a difficult time seeing the world from someone else's perspective. And while I wasn't able to find any concrete tips on how to overcome this, many sources continued to point out the importance of this monumental concept. As mentioned earlier, egocentrism can span even into adulthood, so while the mountain task does perhaps tackle this from a physical perspective, I think this is an important concept that everyone needs to learn at some point in our life. Not so much physically, but to emotionally reach a place of empathy for our fellow humans and really understand where they're coming from. Now I know I've reached beyond the scope of stage two here with this last empathy point, so I'll conclude by saying that these concepts are validated by what I've experienced with my own children, and I think stage two can definitely be a challenging yet rewarding time in a child's cognitive development. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in class.